Hello, and thank you for having me on Earth 300's Impact Talks for 2021. Now, my name is Fabien Cousteau. I'm an aquanaut, an ocean conservationist, and a storyteller. I'm actually a third generation in my family in doing these things. As a matter of fact, my grandfather was speaking about strange things such as climate change as far back as the 1950s. Now, that said, I commend you all for looking at the multidisciplinary initiatives, their impact on sustainability and climate change for today. What I concentrate on is something very fundamentally important to these talks, which is the human ocean connection. Because without talking about the ocean, when we talk about sustainability and climate change, we are missing 99% of the picture. Our ocean is our life support system. It is what makes us possible. And without it, we cannot have constructive talks about living with the planet rather than on it. That human ocean connection is essential for us to make progress in living in symbiotic relationship with this liquid that connects us all and that makes this planet so unique amount amongst all the lifeless brown rocks floating in space. Now, for me, it's not fair to comment on other projects that I'm not associated with or I'm not heading. So let me share with you some examples that I'll pull from uh, our projects with my team and I who are working on it from, for example, the angle of the Fabian Cousteau Ocean Learning Center, which is a nonprofit. You know, our mantra is something my grandfather told me when I was a little boy, which is people protect what they love. And whether we use technology such as 3D printing to restore coral reefs so that we can bring in that youth curiosity, which is so vitally important for our future decision makers to be able to understand the complexities of our ocean world, or whether it's using an element of women empowerment in places like Nicaragua, where we can associate that and their needs along with the needs of sea turtle restoration so that we can protect our ocean planet. Those approaches are extraordinarily important. And of course, we have ambitious projects such as building the International Space Station of the Ocean called Proteus. And Project Proteus was born from an example of an expedition that I had at the world's only remaining laboratory called Aquarius where it opened up my eyes to the need for a better understanding and a better connection with our ocean world and our life support system. Because unless you peek below that blue veneer, and most of us will never get a chance to do so, we'll never get a chance to connect the vast majority of the people without connecting them through storytelling, through solution building, through implementation of ideas. You, are part of the solution. And without all the innovative ideas and all the implementation of those ideas, we will never be able to get into a space of sustainability, especially with regard to things like climate change. So I encourage all of you to do your part and push forward so that our future generations can take over and benefit from the things that we've taken for granted. Remember, people will protect what they love, they love what they understand, and they understand what they're taught. Thank you very much, and good luck on your impact talks. Hello. We painted on cave walls long before we had a common language. We painted, we sculpted, to record our history and to remind ourselves of that which made us the most human, beauty, the aesthetic, nature. And it is art and culture, I believe, that is going to help propel us into the fourth conceptual age in which we try and find a more symbiotic relationship with our environment. My name is Dr. Jasmine Pradesito. I am an artist, a physicist, um, a polymath, I guess, but most importantly, I would call myself an accidental activist. 
I am an environmentalist, it has snuck up on me. And I've been delighted to have been asked to contribute this video for the 300 series in which we try to create an impact in our own individual ways. The material that I have been pioneering, well, I have not created the material, but I have been pioneering how to use it to sculpt for the last four years. And it's here in both of these sculptures behind me. Sculptures that tell the type of story that I think art is very, very good at telling. It's only actually when something becomes personal, I believe, that we actually start to realise that we need to do something about it. And transformation can literally happen overnight. Five years ago or so, my son had a major asthma attack. That evening, lying in accident and emergency, it was the first time that I really started to think about the nature of the breath. I had never really considered it before. Before that, I was using my physics to work in discarded plastics and polarised light. And suddenly I felt compelled, utterly compelled, to start to tell a story about the things that we take most for granted. The things that sustain our being, and yet we bypass every day as we're so distracted and so busy. And strangely enough, a year later, serendipity being one of my favourite words, I was commissioned by Houston to create a sculpture of the second most polluted road in the country. And I created a sculpture called Breathe, which is created out of a material not intended for sculpture, but it has one of the most amazing side effects. A three kilogram sculpture can absorb the NOx, the, the pollutant that is a byproduct of our progress, of our combustion, out of the air for approximately 60 years in an average size room. And so I have been pioneering this material, but to tell a story about what we're losing, how we need to change. So these two, one is called Sankofa, the other one is called The Bird Who Lost Its Song. I really do truly believe that it's not simply what artists create, but how we tell stories. The fact that we are systems thinkers, the fact that we can join many, many dots together that can create the innovations and the stories and the narratives to take us forward. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sebastian Copeland. I'm a polar explorer and a climate analyst and the founder of the Sedna Foundation. At the foundation, we explore the interconnection of uh, our various influences, uh, natural and, um, and human. And of course, we look at anthropogenic impact on biodiversity and uh, various ecosystems. The oceans um, display the same uh, concern um, that its land-based and atmospheric counterparts do, uh, specifically um, high levels of stress uh, leading to what is uh, most likely going to be a total collapse in some regions. Um, and of course, it does not have to be. We uh, could allow the oceans to be the powerful source of solutions that it is if we simply would let it. Uh, with multilateral agreements and policy enforcements, we can help nature do what it does best, and that is to regulate. And I think there are a few low-hanging fruits for that. Uh, one of them is um, essentially using ocean-based uh, renewable energy. In Europe, we have 5,400 offshore uh, wind turbines that meet the growing energy needs of the continent. In the United States, we have exactly uh, seven. So that seems to me um, a, an easy target. Uh, offshore wind turbines are enabling countries like Denmark and Norway and other Scandinavian nation, nations to not just meet but exceed their energy targets for 2035 and 2050. Uh, another area at sea which could certainly reduce greatly emissions is transport with um, with the, the industrial um, uh, transport fleets um, by retooling uh, their energy needs to zero carbon fuels. And we have uh, presently that technology with a growing uh, development in hydrogen and ammonia and some biofuels. And we can certainly phase out the diesel and bunker oil uh, that is not just polluting the oceans themselves, but also the atmosphere. Uh, in terms of coastal and marine ecosystem management, there is an enormous potential with mangroves and salt marshes and seagrasses that store carbon and, um, and the seaweed that can be used for agriculture, that can be used for food, fuel and feed, and certainly reduce greatly the, uh, the land-based counterparts, which are energy intensive and uh, release a lot of carbon dioxide. 
And uh, finally, we've got the fisheries and marine aquacultures. And uh, the uh, basically are meeting a dietary uh, needs uh, by shifting away from uh, land-based protein and more towards a less carbon intensive um, ocean counterpart. Uh, to that effect, however, there's a lot of uh, work to be done. Uh, for one, we absolutely need to empower the smaller fisheries. Uh, essentially, there's a local base uh, fishermen. There's about 125 to 130 million of them around the world that depend on fishing and mostly women, in fact. Uh, but those, um, th those revenue sources are being threatened by the industrial fisheries, uh, fish uh, fishing fleets, that is. Industrial fishing fleets that are being subsidized at the tune of $22 billion annually in public fund. And that needs to stop because these industrial fishing fleets are the ones that are doing the most damage, destroying the seabed and uh, all of its ability to replenish the marine food web. Um, and we need to stop lawlessness at sea, uh, enabling these fleets to, to go essentially unregulated and as well having profound violation of human rights and in many cases, just criminal activities that go um, unpunished. Um, the ocean climate connection is critical. Uh, we need to be connected to what the ocean has been doing to enable us to generate the, uh, the farming cycles that we've been benefiting for the most part of the last 12,000 years and on which we've defined our new modern farming techniques. Without ocean, without climate, we can no longer produce the amount of global calories needed to sustain ourselves as a species. And uh, the good news is we have solutions in hand. It's time to implement them. Thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Jeremy Gilliam, the founder of Peace One Day. Um, thank you, Earth 300, for inviting me to be a part of the Impact Talks. Amazing what you're all doing and feel very humbled and honoured uh, to be involved. Uh, for the last 22 years, I've used storytelling to document the journey of the manifestation of a Peace Day, 21st of September, unanimously adopted by every member state. We've used storytelling to document what happened in Afghanistan, where there was a successful ceasefire, which led to 1.4 million children being vaccinated against polio. Any moment that we can give the combatants to pause, to think and reflect on what they are doing to their own people and to the environment will be a great achievement and I will support it 100%. Uh, we've been documenting and creating events uh, using actors and musicians and all different sectors of society for many years now, um, which has led to about 1.4 billion people being fully aware of the day. Our target is 3 billion people aware of Peace Day by 2025. On the journey to 2025 to hit the 3 billion figure uh, where people are fully aware of that day, um, we have introduced some other shows. 21st of March, the day for the elimination of racial discrimination, we've partnered with OHCHR. Racism is a deeply rooted evil. It transcends generations and contaminate societies. It was very successful this year by using the kind of formula that we've honed for a long time. Uh, we're, we're able to reach a lot of people and, and it'd be amazing for anybody to, who's really interested in impact to go to peaceoneday.org and have a look at some of those figures. But climate action um, is, is crucial. No climate action, no peace. Everybody knows that that's the situation. So we created Climate Action Live on the 21st of June, um, taking the message uh, to many people around the world. I mean, we saw about 7 million impressions uh, around that period, about almost 800,000 engagements, uh, hashtag usage in every single country of the world and thousands watching live. So it's kind of, it's really interesting when we kind of look at these issues of diversity, inclusion, equality, justice climate action, peace day, and of course the mobilization of youth, which we'll do later in the year, as well as the peace day show. And, 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 and working in the way that we are, we can really take the message out there in a big way. Because in the end, it's all about narrative. It's all about narrative. It's all about informing people, engaging people, inspiring people to participate in the manifestation of a more peaceful and sustainable world. And the one thing that we can all do to make that happen is to do exactly what Earth 300 are doing right now, which is putting out constructive messaging in the hope that it inspires people to action. And that's amazing. So well done, Earth 300, for everything that you're doing. Uh, I feel very humbled to have been asked and here's to peace one day.
Hello, I'm Deanna Cohen, co-founder and CEO of Plastic Pollution Coalition. Plastic Pollution Coalition is a global alliance of more than 1,200 organizations and businesses in 75 countries working towards a more just, equitable world free of plastic pollution. Plastic pollution is more than the ugliness of single-use plastics that wash up on our beaches. It is a human health crisis. Plastic pollution is an environmental and social justice issue which disproportionately impacts black and brown communities, indigenous communities, and frontline communities across the United States and around the world. Plastics are poisoning our bodies from the air we breathe to the water we drink to the food we grow and eat. On average, we each consume a credit card sized amount of plastics, microplastics, every week, every week. Carrying toxic chemicals such as carcinogens and endocrine disruptors believed to be changing human reproductive biology and linked to human health issues. Plastic is also contributing to the climate crisis. Every stage of the plastic life cycle emits greenhouse gases from extraction of fossil fuels to manufacturing, use, and disposal, which often involves burning plastics. There are over 350 million tons of plastic produced each year, of which 91% is not recycled. And we know that the goal needs to be less plastic, not more recycled plastic. But if industry has its way, plastic production is set to double in the next 20 years. Plastics will account for more than a third of the global growth of oil demand by 2030 and nearly half by 2050. More than trucks, aviation, and shipping combined. Scientists say we may be reaching an irreversible tipping point on plastic pollution. They say it could contribute to biodiversity loss in the ocean and disrupt the global carbon pump, which will exacerbate climate change. Clearly, we face an immense challenge. Plastic Pollution Coalition educates and connects people and groups to advocate for a world free of plastic pollution. We connect our coalition members to each other and partner with organizations and businesses to reduce the global plastic footprint. We advocate for legislative and policy solutions to change business as usual and stop plastic pollution. One of the ways in which Plastic Pollution Coalition has grown a global movement is by working at the nexus of science, art, and communication. To solve the plastic pollution problem, we need to envision a new way of doing things. Artists can imagine a different world, and by bringing that vision to life, we've begun to shift the system and move in that direction. Art can provoke a visceral response in people, which can be a powerful way of learning and being moved to act. And our phenomenal youth ambassadors are bringing the energy of a new generation into making the world free of plastic pollution a reality. We collaborate with musicians, actors, authors, filmmakers, chefs, surfers, and visual artists, and scientists, of course, who are looking at the plastic pollution issue and thinking about ways to communicate the problem and solutions. And there are incredible solutions and systems solutions to plastic pollution, many created by our coalition member groups and businesses. Non-toxic and reusable systems, refillable systems, which have been proven safe and are the future for the health of humans and the planet. Together we are moving in the right direction, away from fossil fuels, towards a non-toxic sustainable future. Each day puts us closer to a more just, equitable world free of plastic pollution. Together we are working to create a plastic pollution free, climate safe, and environmentally just world that we can proudly pass on to future generations. Scientists say we now have as little as six years to reroute the Titanic to keep global warming to a maximum of 1.5 degrees Celsius. While we are facing this significant challenge, we also celebrate the many solutions coming to life. We invite you to get more involved with us. Please visit our website to learn what you can do and to take action at plasticpollutioncoalition.org. Thank you. Hi, my name is Marino Mejia Lopez. I am 15 years old and I live in Cozumel Island, Mexico. I am very concerned about the state of our planet, particularly poverty and hunger, the destruction of ecosystems and species, the condition that means so much to me. 
We know climate change is a natural process but accelerated by human activities. So we need to take responsibility of them and multidisciplinary approaches are required to address its complexity. That is why I am carrying out two projects. First, aquaponics for my community, which is a sustainable alternative for food security and sustainable water management, which teach families from vulnerable populations to produce their own food, while they protect the health of the soil prevent contamination of the water table and help people to have an economic livelihood by selling the food they grow. The second project is recycling mobile containers, consisting of mobile containers for the separation of solid waste. There are always available in different parts of the island, so they contribute directly to the sustainable management of solid waste in Kosovo and allow the removal of waste of the island while the population runs and has some responsibility for its consumption. These projects start in 2017 in the context of my school, Montessori Pechio, where sustainable development and the SDGs are an integral part of our academic curriculum and are put into practice every day in our campus. We apply the scientific method to observe what happens in our community. So based on the observation of real situations and scientific research, these initiatives start on the premise. What can I make for the well of my community? Then we design the way people could learn and act at the same time. Since island systems are so fragile, these projects contribute to their conservation based on the action of their own citizens. To present our projects at the Youth Impact Forum of the Montessori Mobile Unit of Nations has been key for us, as it is a platform whose methodology allows us to identify the stakeholders linked to these projects and improve the design of the projects for the large scale launch, based on the shared principles of rising our voices to take action and build peace. Exchanging experience with other adolescents and working hand by hand with social actors in a global multidisciplinary context exchanges us. Together we can do more. Hello everyone. My name is Festus Kiplagat, coming to you from the home of athletics champions. I am a chairman and founder to a Green Planet Initiative 2050. We are a grassroots uh, non-profit organization working with vulnerable communities, pastoralists, and forest-dependent communities uh, to restore uh, degraded landscapes. Uh, we do this by improving the sustainability, productivity, equity, and profitability of agricultural landscapes through nature-based solutions. Uh, we co-create more productive and resilient landscapes and agricultural systems uh, while providing small-scale farmers, pastoralists and forest-dependent communities with improved and diversified livelihoods uh, that fosters green rural economic growth. Climate change really and uh, land degradation are, are threatening livelihoods, incomes and food security across sub-Saharan Africa, particularly in communities uh, which rely on rain-fed agriculture, community forests, and pastoralism, uh, what they call agro-pastoralism. Land degradation, land use change, deforestation, and forest degradation represent 24% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions globally and are by far the main source of emissions in most African countries. This also has particularly uh, negative impact on ecosystem goods and services upon which communities rely, which ultimately undermines the resilience and adaptive capacity of these uh, populations in the face of climate change and now the pandemic. These impacts are compounded by unsustainable uh, land use practices uh, that degrade the land. Climate resilience and land restoration is driven by healthy ecosystems, 
which are crucial to support poor and vulnerable communities that rely upon natural resources for their livelihoods. Reversing a land degradation and achieving sustainable land management are essential to addressing food insecurity, rural poverty, and enhancing the resilience of forest-dependent communities. We are bottom-up in our approach. We create green movements, farmer to farmer, village to village, region to region spread of ecosystem restoration, working with women uh, to build resilient landscapes. Hi everyone, my name is Leander, I'm 20 years old. I am the co-founder and current CEO of 25400, located in Zurich, Switzerland and in Athens in Greece. Our mission is to empower the next generation to create future solutions through an intergenerational collaboration. Our aim is to provide and develop solutions for the 10 most pressing issues that we humans face. One of the most important things to us at 25400 is that we work cross generations because we believe that if we fight and always say that the older generations or the younger generations, they're not doing it right, we will not lead to anywhere. That means we as 25400 want to make sure that young people do have a seat at the table and decide about our future, how we will move forward, but also learn from cross generations and more experienced people in order to make the most and biggest impact that we can. Now, talking on multidisciplinary actions, it has been talked about since many, many years. And look where we are today. I think that it is definitely the solution to work towards more impact, but it will take a lot to be able to solve all the issues that we face in the world. Especially on climate change, we need to drastically change the way how we think, meaning how we work, how our economy is working. And we like to say always that we need to work towards an impact economy. An impact economy where sharing is above taking away from others, where greed and selfishness is not the driver. It is really about an impact economy where we thrive as humanity, wanting the best, wanting the most impact, and do things better from now on and change things for the mass, not only for the 1%. Now, talking on the level of climate change, it is definitely one of the most pressing issues that we're facing, meaning that it is at the top of our agenda. On climate change, we've asked ourselves the, the question, how can young people contribute the best? And we believe through action. And that's why we've called Klima into life. Klima is the first youth climate fund that provides capital to young individuals who have come up with ideas and technologies that change the way how we treat our climate, how our environment, and how we live on this planet. Now, with this climate fund, we don't only want to funnel money into ideas that you know, create and protect our environment, but actually have a business idea behind it as well. Because we want to actually make a statement that climate finance makes sense, can make revenue, but also at the same time create an impact that we can live with and not destroy our planet. We have realized that there is a lot of climate finance talks you know, coming up now. There's a lot of promises by big governmentals um, on big governmental levels. But where innovation actually happens is on the private sector, especially grassroots level, right? And this is where we come in. We really take ideas from the bottom up 
see, evaluate them, and hopefully bring them to a, a stage where they're market ready, they can go out there and actually create what we've always said, an impact economy. And this is our way, how we want to contribute to what we call the impact economy. So thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to um, having the talks at um, Impact Talks at Earth 300 and connecting with like-minded people who are doing amazing things for our planet. Thank you.